Largely forgotten today, the Native American Calusa people who inhabited southern Florida in the 1500s built a sophisticated but unusual society. It wasn't merely the fact that they forged a swampland kingdom whose capital stood atop an artificial island, nor was it how they resisted Spanish influence for centuries. What truly made the Calusa stand out was the fact that they built their complex, sedentary civilization without farming. Wait, how could they be a civilization without farming? Hello, welcome to Secondhand History. I am your narrator, and Egghead manages the details. Today's subjects are the Calusa, a now extinct Native American people that once dominated the Florida Everglades, and whose peculiar culture raises interesting questions for anthropologists and historians. The origins of the Calusa and their kingdom are something of a mystery. No oral history about the tribe survives today, and all written sources come from European explorers and missionaries. However, archaeological evidence from the site of their former capital, a large man-made island near modern-day Cape Coral, suggests that their rise to power began centuries before the arrival of Europeans. From the island, the kingdom's ruler governed a stratified society divided between a class of noble elites and the common people. The Calusa also had a reputation as fierce warriors. Neighboring tribes reportedly feared them and offered routine tribute to stay on the Calusa king's good side. By the time of their contact with the Spanish, their kingdom spanned most of southwest Florida with a population of between 10 and 50,000. Still pretty small by the standards of, say, the Aztecs, but nothing to sneeze at, either. What really made the Calusa unique, though, was how they kept their population fed. Most large, sedentary societies throughout history relied on farming to sustain themselves, but not the Calusa. They knew about agriculture from neighboring tribes, but except for some small vegetable gardens, they never practiced it themselves. The Calusa were hunter-gatherers, and above all, they fished. This strategy was viable partly due to the natural abundance of food sources in the Everglades, but they went beyond merely living off the land in its natural state. The Calusa dug channels connecting surrounding bodies of water to large fish ponds, which they used to corral and trap schools of fish to be caught later at their leisure. In this manner, the Calusa gained some ability to store food for hard times, a critical advantage agricultural societies often had over traditional hunter-gatherers. Spanish explorers first encountered the Calusa in 1513 and quickly discovered why other tribes feared them. They scared off the first explorers by surrounding their ships with war canoes full of archers, and after the next few expeditions met their end amid a hail of poison arrows, the Spanish left the Calusa alone for several decades. Even as Mesoamerica fell under Spanish rule, the situation worked out well enough for the Calusa, as routine Spanish shipwrecks brought in a supply of precious metals and other cool new stuff. Eventually, the Spanish came back and managed to establish something of a working relationship with the Calusa in 1566. They even briefly received permission to build a small outpost in the capital, but relations soon turned frosty and unstable again, and all Spanish attempts to absorb the tribe into their empire, peacefully or otherwise, failed. Admittedly, part of this was because Spain realized that Florida lacked enough high-value resources to justify the effort, but the Calusa's dogged resistance certainly deserves credit, too. Eventually, the European diseases that had decimated other natives caught up with the Calusa and sent their kingdom into decline. The final blow came in the early 18th century, not from the Spanish, ironically, but from native Creek and Yamasee slavers allied with the English. They invaded Calusa territory, and unlike the bow-wielding Calusa, they had modern European flintlock muskets. It was a curb stomp. The surviving Calusa were either taken as slaves, absorbed into other tribes, or accepted Spanish offers to evacuate to their colonies in the Caribbean. Many people, even archaeologists, forgot they even existed. But exist, they did, and the fact that they existed in the first place raises interesting implications for a notoriously hard-to-define concept. Civilization. Attempts to pin down a relatively objective definition of civilization, as we understand the term today, began in earnest in the 20th century. Previously, 18th and 19th century European writers most often used the word to refer to the summation of all human progress at any given point of time. That is to say, whoever is quote-unquote most advanced is civilized, and by that, Europeans meant themselves. Today, scholars differ on the exact criteria a civilization must meet, but they typically include permanent population centers, monumental architecture, political centralization, 
And it almost goes without saying, farming. In fact, agriculture is often treated as a prerequisite for civilization, a necessary baseline for the other attributes to arise. Yet despite building a small but centralized kingdom whose capital stood atop an artificial island, the Calusa skipped the whole farming bit. Does that disqualify them? One could argue that the Calusa were an edge case, or that they weren't a true kingdom but what some older anthropologists called a quote-unquote complex chiefdom. But even if they are an extreme example, the Calusa are not alone in defying easy categorization. The Inca, who few deny were civilized, never developed a complete writing system. The Mongols did. The so-called Celtic barbarians, Caesar fought in Gaul, built fortified settlements supported by farming, while Gobekli Tepe in modern-day Turkey, perhaps the world's oldest example of monumental architecture, was likely built by hunter-gatherers. We're not even touching on the value connotations of the word civilization. In light of these issues, the current trend is to move away from a rigid, all-or-nothing checklist approach. In a world that gave us the Calusa, perhaps we should keep an open mind as to what makes a civilization, well, civilized. Is there anything you wish to add, egghead? Yes! Shouldn't you mention the growing number of scholars who want to ditch the term civilization entirely? Is that so? Given the ambiguities that we just talked about, as well as the term's historical association with colonialism and claims of superiority, a growing number of anthropologists advocate phasing it out entirely in favor of a more neutral term like culture. Well, that still isn't all or even most scholars. And besides, even with the term's ambiguity and ethical baggage, isn't there still value in noting the commonalities between, say, Rome, China, and the Aztecs relative to the Huns, Zanu and Chichimex respectively? You can, but there are other ways to do it. And more importantly, even there, the value judgments are still relevant. Aside from being nomadic, what connects those three latter groups is that they were all derided as barbarians. Case in point in how uncritically embracing the civilized, uncivilized paradigm can perpetuate some pretty nasty stuff. Are you calling me part of the problem? Yes. Well, history is written by the victors. Thank you for watching, please like and subscribe, and hope to see you next time.